Uh, first of all, this uh, talk, this event is co-sponsored by the European Union program as well as the Judas Rabinovitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. My name is Atif Mia. I'm also the director of the Judas Rabinovitz Center. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to, uh, to introduce uh, Luis Garicano, um, a dear <coughs> friend of ours. It's a pleasure to have him visit uh, Princeton over these few days. Um, Luis has a long, distinguished um, career. Um, most of us got to know him first as a, a superb academic and economist. He did his PhD from University of uh, Chicago, where he was then also a full professor of economics and strategy at University of uh, Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, from there, he moved on to the uh, London School of Economics, where he was uh, again a professor of uh, economics. Um, but um, Luis's academic work um, is uh, on the question of uh, organizational theory and how that impacts uh, the macro economy, the, the way we organize the society and the way decision making happens inside organizations, how that ultimately affects the real economy, the macro economy. And while most of us um, who delve into such questions, we will be comfortable just dealing with the theoretical aspects of it. Uh, Luis actually took a plunge on the practical side as well. Um, and he um, went into uh, public service, went into politics, and he um, just uh, finished his uh, three-year uh, term as member of uh, European Parliament. And uh, he was a member of the Spanish liberal uh, Tidadas party, I'm trying to correct my pronunciation there. Um, and he's uh, currently on leave uh, from his post as professor of economics and strategy uh, at IE Business School in Madrid. But Luis, because of his uh, unique background, being an academic, but also uh, being a member of uh, parliament in the European Union, where I must say he also, uh, you know, uh, very uh, eloquently and courageously took up some very important issues of the day, including the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis that went along with it, but also in more personal capacity, perhaps I know how much he stood out for human rights and uh, around the world. So uh, we, we thank him for his public service. And again, it's a pleasure to have him. Look forward to his talk today on, on Europe. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a, a huge pleasure to be here. Is there, is there, is there, is there a label microphone? I couldn't do it. Yes, now it is. Now it is. So it's, it's a huge pleasure to be here and to, and to be able to, uh, to talk to such a distinguished audience and young people who are experts. Um, when we put when we put the game when when we put the talk we didn't realize the game uh, in Spain would be would be today. So uh, when the penalty kicks are up or down, you just tell me what happens. Okay, it's a very un-European thing to be talking when your own country's team is playing. Um, so it's 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 wonderful to be here. Uh, what I want to do is I want to talk. I mean, I could I could do. A, I mean, Atif and me were talking. What was the right was the right talk for for this audience and what's the right approach and. And I thought I would do a talk that is, it's, a, it's really a policy talk. I mean, you will have obviously a lot of economics, but it's really a policy talk. It's about where the European Union is and, 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 and where does it, does, it, does, it, does it go next. Um, I've been thinking about these issues with, with John Cochrane and with Klaus Masuk and, and with many people here, to be honest. I mean, there is, there is uh, uh, a lot that I've learned from, from many people here, uh, from reading them or from working with them on, on these topics. Uh, uh, Marcus and me, in particular, have have uh, a long history of trying to get uh, Europe to uh, to think a little bit more 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 carefully about about this stuff. And I also did some of it in Parliament. Um, European integration uh, is is basically uh, something that has been advancing in a in a in a in a, in a, in a very kind of. Uh, a priori, would say an optimal way. Basically, the the key metaphor is Jean Monnet's, which is that. The European Union will be built in crisis, and that the, 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 what we see will be the result of the decisions adopted in those crises. That's exactly what you see and what we're going to talk. I want to tell you a little bit about the crisis that got us to where we are. Um, and, and the idea is, is, is this neo-functional story is that, I mean, you, you make one step, um, and Sophia, I don't know, she's not here. <laughs> she, was telling me, she was telling me yesterday about, about the way she has uh, conceived this metaphor, which I like very much, which is the idea of falling forward, right? In Europe, they talk about the bicycle. The bicycle is always falling. The important thing is that it falls forward, right? It's never in equilibrium. 
Uh, the problem is that when you do this in a complex system, you get with a set of clutches, right? So, so this is this is a clutch. Uh, I, I I wanted a, a picture of a clutch from the internet, and that was the one that I thought was most adequate. So. Um, Basically, you think of a complex system with complementary parts that you don't design from a start by fitting them, but you just put one part, and then given that part, you try to fit another part. And given, you're never going to design a television like that, right? It's like, okay, so I'll put a chip, and it will be for a radio, and that's what I have now, and then I'll, it's never going to end up with a complex system. That's the whole point of complementarities uh, uh, between, between multiple parts. And, and to a large extent, that's what happens to Europe. This is, this is a, <clears throat> a slide on the on the Stability and Growth Pact. This is the set of fiscal rules that govern Europe. I'll talk a little bit about them, so I don't want you to now uh, understand the slide, but just let me just tell you, for example, so these are the reforms. There have been big reforms in, in, in it, was, it was set up with the Maastricht Treaty, uh, uh, at least not the pact, but, but, but the, the rules. Then there was the pact. There were several reforms in 05, 11, 12, 13, 15. And you can see, for example, just look at the flexibilities. Deficit bigger than 3% now acceptable. Special circumstances, negative activity growth, unusual event clause, creation of general escape clause. You add and add and add and add in this crisis, and at the end you get the system that is a nightmare. So, for example, look at uh, what happens if you have an excessive deficit. Well, the commission has an opinion. It proposes that there's a, too much deficit. Then the council, by qualified majority vote, decides that, yes, there is excessive deficit, then it goes to the commission to recommend what's going to happen. Then there is another council decision on what is this excessive uh, recommendation, what is the recommendation for excessive deficit. Then if there's no action, the commission proposes this again in qualified majority voting. And then there are sanctions potentially that the council decides, the commission recommend, recommends again, and the council can revert it by reverse qualified majority vote. I mean, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Um, similarly, uh, in, in this fiscal space, but much more broadly, look what was happening now with, with Orban, basically because there is no rule of law in Hungary and Europe has said, look, this is enough. Europe has really demanded that uh, we have introduced a procedure that allows to demand uh, that, that he makes certain changes that comply with the rule of law, particularly we have to do with corruption. So he doesn't get his money. So what is he doing? He's blocking uh, 18 billion in to Ukraine. He's blocking NATO accession by Finland and Sweden. I mean, these are big strategic decisions that Hungary is not. He said he would vote on it, okay? They're, they haven't voted. But, and he's blocking, of course, the 15% the uh, minimum tax uh, agreement from the OECD. So <clears throat> all these things are what I'm going to kind of tell you where they come from and what are potentially some solutions. But let me tell you that it's possible that the market is kind of worried about Europe or starts to worry about Europe. These are... European debt instruments. I will talk much more about this later. But these are three. This is not a. This is not a current a euro debt. It has joined a several liability from all the member states, so it should be. It should be similar to German uh, or Dutch debt. And as you see, it's more similar to between France and Spain debt. The, 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 the spreads are, are growing. Um, it looks like um, the market has doubts. This is now including the euro bonds, and and you see once the European Central Bank is stopped buying these bonds the spreads have increased. OK, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to first start by telling you where, where, where we're trying to come from and why all these things work the way they do. Then I will talk about how the euro showed that there were problems and what, um, what was the solution adopted. Then how QE kind of requires quantitative easing, requires certain intervention of the ECB that the treaty drafters hadn't thought about. How QE is a different animal in Europe and in the US, with multiple countries and with the constraints that we have. Then we'll talk about uh, COVID and how uh, common sovereign debt, there was, a, there was a promise of a new system, but I think the, the promise betrayed something that didn't really work, and, and, and how the, the reality of the energy and crisis and war makes me very worried about the future. <clears throat> a lot of people here have talked Mm -hmm. and written about the euro crisis, I'm going to be very, very brief on that and just go to what are the, what are the solutions. So let me just start from the start. <laughs> the Maastricht Treaty, and many of you are experts on this topic, so allow me to, to go quickly through this. The Maastricht Treaty uh, designs a Europe with a very limited, the European Monetary Union with a very limited uh, fiscal capacity and says, well, look, since we're going to have a very limited fiscal capacity, we're going to have to be very careful to avoid that 
the member states overspend and look for bailouts, etc., to compensate. And so um, what they decided was, okay, we're going to be austere, we're going to borrow moderately, we're going to have little uh, aggregate borrowing. And in order to make sure this works, we're going to have a triple lock. Strategy is going to have, we're going to have three ways to avoid this borrowing going out of control. The first is we're going to prohi prohibit the monetary financing from the central bank. Second, we're going to put limits on the deficits and debt. And third, we're going to introduce a no bailout clause. So the limits on the monetization are very, very clear. The, the treaty drafters thought um, there, were, there wasn't going to be QE. I mean, it's very much about interest rate uh, policy. And, and the Article 123 says um, it's absolutely impossible for the ECB to, to have overdraft facilities with the governments or the regional authorities, and they cannot purchase directly um, any uh, debt. On the fiscal rules, the Maastricht deficit, the treaty sets up a 3%, famous 3% uh, debt deficit and 60% debt limit that is developed by the Stability and Growth Pact that I was referring to at the very start, and of course, a Nobel rule. That's the triple lock that tries to accommodate. The Nobel rule says um, a member state shall not be liable, it's pretty clear, or assume the commitments of other, or other public authorities, nor will the European Union do that either. So, that's what the treaty says. But if you think about it, what it doesn't say, it's also very important, right? The treaty assumes that this is going to work. So there are no tools for the case where it doesn't work. Notably, there is no IMF, OK? When you set up Britain Boots and you have kind of all this, all this system, you assume that there could be current account crisis, et cetera, and that you would have to intervene. There is no IMF here. And there is no debt restructuring. So if you're in trouble, you neither can look to a debt restructuring solution and you can look to other people bail out. So what are you looking for? We don't know. We just don't get in trouble. That's the treaty rule. Don't get in trouble, OK? As we know, humans tend to get in trouble. Um, so the second thing that is absent, that it's absolutely critical and it's absent even today, is banking union, OK? So um, the, this is, this is a, an objection from particularly from Germany. They, they, they wanted a bank that was concerned with monetary policy, a central bank was concerned with monetary policy, and not with banking policy. So there was no banking regulation, supervision, resolution, no deposit insurance. With the, treat, with, the, with the crisis, some of those things exist. There is a regulator and supervisor. There is a resolution institution now, the ESRM. But the way I want you to think about it, it won't come up a lot today, but it's a bit like a Rolls Royce parked in the garage. We have a very fancy resolution institution, very costly but it doesn't do any resolutions. And there is no deposit insurance. Um, again, if there is no banking crisis, that's all good. But there, if there are banking crises, there is no solution uh, envisaged for so solving a banking crisis. In fact, the lender of last resort, which is the emergency liquidity uh, assistance, uh, is actually national. These are the national central banks who, who do it in the treaty, So, which is strange because there is no such a thing as a national central bank. It's, I mean, formally, legally, there is. But in theory, there's just the European system of central banks. So there's kind of a lack of trust in the whole construction. So as you know, the euro crisis tested it. I'm going to go very, very quickly through that because you know we could spend, I mean, we have people here that could spend the whole day on this. And I am going to try to spend very little. So basically, once the euro comes, I, you can reverse the causality, OK? I don't want to get into trouble with the causality. But let me just tell you one way to tell the story. Um, there is really um, a sense that there is no renomination risk. You basically, the Greek and, 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 and Portuguese and all the other interest rates converge uh, to, the, to the ones on, in Germany, or even better, institutional reforms stop because money is flowing very well. When we looked at this, many people thought, OK, this is pretty good. For once, the international the uh, economics predictions that money flows from rich to poor is actually working. So, But the fact is these current account deficits are, are, are adding up, and the net foreign investment position of uh, these four countries, uh, particularly, is, is really very problematic. Um, and you get into this doom loop, of which I think, uh, a diabolic loop, I think, uh, Marcus, I don't know, but I think you were the first person to write about it. But I think diabolic didn't catch as much as doom, so I, 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 diabolic was, was Marcus's word for it. So the doom loop was basically the sovereigns are responsible for the banks, as I told you before, and the banks basically are holding 
uh, a huge part of the sovereign debt. So once one of them goes bad, the other one goes. And I'm not going to tell you about it except show you one cool example, which is Ireland. Um, so Ireland, 2007, you're funding all this real estate lending and all these other, as you know, uh, non-liquid, uh, <clears throat> all these long-term assets with basically uh, deposits and short-term debt securities. People pull these deposits and short-term debt securities away. So how are you going to finance your balance sheet? Basically, sheet, basically the euro system and the ELA. The in between, the government of Ireland has said all deposits are granted by the government of Ireland. Okay, so in between, basically, the government of Ireland has become liable for this. But of course, people are worrying. Oh yeah, so is this guarantee I should leave my deposit? Are you sure the bank of the government of Ireland is going to be able to 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 pay me? So in fact, people pull the deposits, <laughs> and it was the basically not just the euro system. This is with collateral. This is without collateral. Not just the euro system, but the ELA, which was basically financing these banks. That's why um, at this point. Um, Trichet picks up the phone November 2010 and says, look, we're not going to do this anymore. You have to go into a bailout. Um, this is from a Marcus and, and Harold uh, presentation, uh, uh, just to, to, uh, to pay homage to their, to, to all, the, all, all the, we learned at that point from them, basically uh, fly to safety, uh, the money moving uh, from the south to the north and uh, getting this, this loop going badly. Um, a lot of things happen, but basically for what concerns us today, um, it finishes with Draghi's whatever it takes. But people don't understand that whatever it takes very well. I mean, it's true that he makes this un uh, unlimited commitment. True, okay? Ready to do whatever uh, it takes. But this is very important. <laughs> Look at his May speech um, the following year. It is important in providing the ECB with adequate assurance that intervention supporting sovereign debt bond prices do not mutate into financial subsidies for unsustainable national policies. What is important? Conditionality. This was not unconditional money. In order to get this money, okay, you had to be in what is called in Europe a program. Okay? A program is you have to be, well, you know it from the IMF. Um, Ashoka, in fact, I think you did one of these programs, no? You did the, the, the Irish one. Okay, I thought it was the Greek, actually. I, I, had, I had it wrong. So you had to be in a program. Um, so what does it mean? Two very important things. The fiscal authorities are there. It's not the European Central Bank deciding who has to be bailed out and who doesn't, or deciding to bail out everybody. The, the fiscal authorities do it. This is going to be very crucial for our story, okay? Um, the fiscal authorities do it. Yes, I would do unlimited but there has to be, the ESM has to agree, the, the governments, okay, and I will tell you what the ESM is in a second, the IMF, I think IMF, European IMF, has to negotiate a rescue. There are two important things. One, there is fiscal backing. If the ACB stops doing it, the member states are responsible. There is a backstop. Two, there are conditions, okay? You have to be in a program and you're going to do certain things. Um, what is the ESM? The ESM is outside the European Union law. It's not part of the European Union. It's an agreement between member states to um, create this bailout instrument. Um, they, put, um, they, they, they put 80 billion. They allow, they say, we will go up to 704 billion and we will over collateralize it. We'll only lend up to 500 billion in order to try to get AAA status, which they didn't get, but okay. Uh, but they got some, but not, not everybody. So I think. Largely, Mario Draghi avoided, and we can discuss this, and people can be in disagreement, avoided the breakout of the euro very successfully without putting the whole treaty in jeopardy because he avoided creating the risk of high inflation and an unsustainable uh, public debt by ensuring the conditionality and the fiscal backup. Yassine, whenever you know what's happening, you tell me, okay? I'm trusting you to, to tell me. It's going to be zero, zero. It's going to be zero, zero forever. I know, so I'm not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Just, we, we, maybe we can, we can turn on the, the TV for the penalties. Quantitative, <laughs> quantitative easing um, is the next stage. Okay, so we finish with Draghi. Notice there is a fiscal monetary kind of combination that I think ensures that the ECB can get out and Europe can get out of the trouble. Then comes quantitative easing. I mean, the ECB has done it, the Fed has done it, the Japanese bank has done it, and the Fed, the ECB faces the same trouble. There's no inflation, so we're also going to do it, okay? Um, two aspects. 
a covered bond uh, program and an asset-backed security, uh, and, and then a public sector. So uh, first the asset purchase program, then the public sector purchases. So we're going to help the banks. We're going to help the states. Uh, no, not help, sorry. This is the wrong word for QE. We're going to buy assets. Uh, we, I mean, I do think in Europe has a quasi-fiscal aspect, but we can, we can go in, in another direction. So they pro, the treaty, as we saw, prohibits monetary financing. So how are we going to do that? So the ECB, using the case law from, <laughs> from previously, and which was referenced, which was approved later by both the German and the European court, says, look, this is not going to be monetary financing because we're going to do two things. First, we're not going to buy a lot of any issue. And second, we're going to buy all national debt together. So it would be monetary financing if I was choosing one country, helping them. But it's not going to be because I'm going to buy kind of a combination of European debt. They should have done it with a proposal that Marcus and, and others did, which I was, I was part of, which is kind of buying a synthetic European bond. But okay, that would, have been, that would have been too much to ask. So this is the capital guidance. So we're going to do the same as the capital, the capital key guidance. We're going to compute the capital key and borrow and lend according to the capital key. Of course, as you say, see, it has been, it has been, um, it has been separated, and we will see why. So that was the idea. It's going to be like the Fed. I mean, obviously, you can all see me that it has a lot of consequence in Europe that it wouldn't have in the U.S. So <clears throat> the second part, as I was saying, is a, a direct a, a loan to, to banks, the targeted long-term refinancing operations. Um, it's kind of different than the Fed in that it's conditional on, on a certain use of the funds and that it's long-term rather than overnight. But there's a lot of financing directly to the banks. You will see how much in a second at below market rates. Okay. So the banks get this money for three years, um, for example, and they very often deposit it back at the ECB and they just get the carry. I mean, this is the best carry trade in the world. The same guy who lends it, takes it, and pays you 1.5% difference. So what's there not to like? Okay, this has been happening. This, this kind of transfer has been happening in the last uh, few, few weeks. Uh, the ECB just put an end to it. Um, so... These are, forget about this part, because this part I'm going to tell you in, in, in two minutes, which is the pandemic. So these are the programs, uh, sovereigns, banks, pre-pandemic. We're talking about six, seven hundred billion uh, for banks and for the states. We're talking about a little bit over two trillion. Um, then the pandemic comes and our story gets, gets now uh, interesting and, and new to, to some extent to, to, to those of you who've been uh, stop in looking with the euro crisis. Or stop looking with the euro crisis. So again, the ECB moves first. The ECB um, introduces um, a couple of new programs, uh, very important, pandemic emergency purchase program. Um, this has a beautiful story that I'm not going to tell you, but basically Lagarde comes to a press conference in March after the pandemic starts, and she says, look, our job is not to avoid spreads growing, um, and the moment she says this, that we are not going to, we don't care if one country relative to another, etc. that's a fiscal problem. Um, our problem is, is the aggregate. Um, she said that the whole market uh, went crazy. And two or three hours later, she had to go on a CNBC interview to say, yes, yes, the spreads is our objective and our problem. As long as, and this is the trick, this is the European Central Bank trick, it comes everywhere, as long as, it because, or as long as, because it makes the transmission of monetary policy difficult. That's the trick, right? I want to have, for example, raise, let's say raise, so lower interest rates for one point to two countries, um, but in one country, when I raise interest rates, as the easiest example to see, then people start worrying about their solvency, and instead of one, the interest rates go up by three, right? So that's the kind of what they mean by transmission. Here, we want to facilitate good conditions, so uh, blending conditions everywhere, and then some countries are in trouble because they have a lot of COVID. So this is, this is, this is correct, except that it gets really close to fiscal, as you realize, because that means that you are unbounding your, your shackles and say, I'm going to not have issue limits. I'm not going to have this idea of buying and selling everything at the same time, and I'm going to basically give myself the, the ability to intervene differentially in different countries. 
Uh, this is this is the the PPP program, which started with 700 billion, uh, billion went up to almost two trillion. Um, what happens with the fiscal side? The euro crisis. There was a very very clear view that there wouldn't be one. Okay. Uh, Angela Merkel had been very adamant, and she really had explicitly said it that wouldn't be joint European debt. And I I honestly think that. That was, that was meant, and when I went to the parliament, I really never thought that I would see European debt being issued. Um, the way to, how, if there was no European debt, how were these bailouts conducted? Um, there was the EFSF. There were two instruments, and Europe always, nomenclature is crazy, right? There's the ESM, the EFSF, and the EFSM. I mean, there's just nobody in the room, uh, in the room who can tell the difference. But okay, EFSF. Um, EFSF is basically the large vehicle which is um, uh, issued by the member states. The EFSM and the ESM are, well, the ESM is also issued by the member states, the permanent IMF, remember, ESM, IMF. But then there's the AEFSM, which is actually the little borrowing that the European Union did as a whole. And there was a way to do it, which was, look, we're going to use a treaty article that says that the Council can do, how do we circumvent all these joint borrowing uh, prohibitions? The Council on the Proposition from the Commission may grant under certain conditions union financial assistance to the member state concerned. So there's a hole. And first, it is exploited, the holes. In, uh, 122 has two different holes, so let me not go, uh, if you allow me not to go into the super detail. But there is a hole that allows the union to go and assistance of a member state. The first one was with the EFSM, and it's exploited for the shore, um, which is if we are below the margin of the European Union, the margin on the budget, there's a budget that is approved for everybody, and I can go in detail if you, that if you want. There's a ceiling. If there's a little bit of space over that ceiling, we can use it. That was the ceiling, so there was a little bit of space, and the rest we do as member states with this joint sovereign guarantee. So that's how they issued shore. Sure is, for those who are Germans or know of Germany, it's like Kurzarbeit. Um, basically, it's a system. Remember, during pandemic, US subsidizes unemployment. Europe subsidizes employment. You are linked to your job, and we pay you to continue being linked to your employer, even though you're not actually working. Okay, So we just subsidize the continuation of the link. We, you're, you receive your salary as if you were going to your office, but you're at home. Okay, So sure is the European vehicle to do that. That's 100 billion, but it still has two key characteristics that don't make it European debt in, a, in the sense that I'm going to talk about it in a second. It's back-to-back -back lending. So this instrument borrows in order to lend, not to give. And it's with a guarantee from the member states directly, not from the EU budget. Um, there is a second step, and that step um, I, was, I was there and I contributed, hopefully, and I participated in the legislation. It was really a fascinating moment for Europe. There was a sense that the European Union was falling apart. Italy and Spain were, were devastated by the pandemic. Um, there was a sense that you had to, the Europe had to show solidarity uh, and that there has to be a recovery had to be done together. And Europe decided to put together the next generation plan, which was 750 billion uh, euros at 2018 prices, so it's going to be end up something like a trillion in terms of borrowing, uh, given the inflation that we have now. Um, that would be distributed to countries according to a particular key, which didn't have to do so much with the pandemic, but with youth unemployment and unemployment. Anyway, it w there was found a key that would make sure that Italy and Spain would get the biggest part of the portion. Now, what is new here? What is new here is it is not back to back lending. A big part of this, red and black, this is what's new, the red and black parts are grants. Europe is borrowing to give you money, not to lend you money. Okay. Second, um, it is actually not guaranteed by the individual member states through international treaty like the ones we saw before. This is actually guaranteed by the European Union budget. Okay. The European Union, which issues, like if they were a sovereign lender. So many of us like to think of this as a Hamiltonian moment. Remember Alexander Hamilton? We've all been thinking about it for, 
for many reasons, including the, the music. But in Europe, even apart from the musical, people were very, uh, very, uh, very much thinking of him. Um, you get everybody in a room, and you say, okay, the southern states have, have uh, ample solvency, the northern states are indebted. This is the contrary in Europe, this is the US. We lost. Hasta la vista, baby. Okay, so I'm glad that I was doing something else. If it had been 7 0, I would be like so crushed. You know? but, Ah, okay, so <laughs> now on to less important things. <laughs> so, um, the grantee is from the European Union budget, and as I was telling you, many of us wanted to think of it as Hamilton's as a Hamiltonian moment, where Hamilton puts and Hamilton and Madison and Jefferson get compromised, where the whole union is going to assume the debt of the entire European uh, of the entire U.S. And uh, the north, uh, the, the way the northern states are going to compensate the south is by moving the capital. I always thought it was a very cheap price, to be honest, but okay. They moved the capital from New York and Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., right, to Virginia. So for some of us, this was like, okay, there's now going to be some common fiscal policy, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, for that, you need two things. You need this to be a recurrent instrument that has kind of some common government behind, but also you need some revenue. You need somebody to pay, to repay this. The way the EU budget revenues work today is basically like the United Nations. I mean, for all our pretense to have this really supranational institution, etc., the way the European Union is financed is by just going with a hat to the member states and getting a contribution. It's not like the European Union can say, tomorrow the taxes are instead of three, there are four, and that's the end of the story. It has to go to the member states. The basic reason for this is the check, is the Margaret Thatcher uh, going with her bag and saying, I want my money back. Before, it was more financed by the members, by the, by the directly, but post Thatcher, you have to calculate how much everybody has put and then allow some people to get rebates, the Northern State gets rebates, the Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, no longer. And so, at the end, the stuff that goes to the European Union directly is a minority, and most of it is haggled. So how are you going to repay this debt? We put in this legislation, the way you're going to repay this debt is by having certain new taxes, new on revenues that will go to the common pot. Like plastics tax, a digit tax, a digital tax, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, et cetera, et cetera. The problem, of course, is that member states, every time there's any new source of revenue, and they're really constrained, as you will see in a second, they're not happy to just give Europe the money and say, okay, fine, okay? So it's nice, there is a desideratum that this revenue is going to be there to repay the taxes, but the truth of the matter is there isn't, okay? The taxes right now, the, 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 the borrowing that we issued, right now, we don't know how it's going to be paid. There could be, it could be paid in one of three ways. We could decrease, when the repayments start to come due, we can decrease the money for the other programs, politically impossible. We can increase the government's contribution to the European Union, politically even more impossible. We could give some taxes that go to the European Union. As I told you, that would be probably the best thing, but it's not going to happen. So those three are impossible. What's the fourth? The fourth is let's just roll it over ad infinitum. And that's probably what will happen. This thing will be rolled over. So there was a quasi Hamiltonian moment. Yes, there is joint borrowing, but there's no joint revenue to repay. There is no any supply of repayment. This debt, by the way, just a funny thing, is statistically missing. It's not debt of the member states, and it's not debt of Europe, so there is no, there's, there's no accounting for it in the European Union frameworks. Um, and so there is an appearance of a new EU fiscal capacity, but I mean, I, I love to hear your disagreements. There's a lot of people here who have informed opinions on this, but it's really the appearance of a joint fiscal capacity as opposed to a reality. And, and the way you can test it is by seeing what happens now. So now we are... At the, at the key point in our story, where really all these contradictions are going to show up. Um, so we have an energy crisis, and um, there is all the countries realize politically this is a nightmare. The voters, without heating or without electricity, that's going to kill any government. So the governments go really all out. Of course, inflation is increasing. Okay, so we are kind of in a very situation, different situation in 2012 when. Okay, we have to go all out. In theory, we didn't in some extent, but we have to go all out. And interest rates are low, inflation is low, everything. Now it's like the opposite. 
So the ECB is at the same time trying to tighten as the states are trying to spend more. Um, so um, the governments really go all out. This is data from three days ago. Okay, so this is the most current data. Look at the energy energy expenditure by country. Okay, like Germany is on eight percent of GDP, uh, like Malta. Okay, um, but I mean the average EU expenditure is something like six percent. Okay, you you have to count for the fact that. This is obviously some countries are bigger than others, but Germany in particular. So it's almost 6% what is being spent in the energy crisis. And it's really not a great intervention, okay? If, you're, if you are into policy and you look at all these programs, it's pretty pathetic, okay? There are, I mean, there are transfers to vulnerable groups in many places, but there are direct gasoline taxes in almost every, uh, uh, gasoline subsidies in spite of global warming and everything we've said in, in many, many countries, like in the US too. Um, so, what does the ECB do? So the ECB says, woof, what a mess. We have all this inflation out of control. It's all energy. Of course, the ECB says we weren't wrong. It was all the energy crisis. I mean, I think there was an excessive um, amount of, of expanding in the economy and a very much out of control fiscal position. But anyway, they say it's all energy. Fine. Um, so we need to reverse our quantitative easing like the Federal Reserve is doing. But we also are scared about all this borrowing kind of getting some countries in trouble. So how are we going to do it? They invent the transmission protection instrument. And again, these words that I told you in 12 come, and, and 15 come back, it's about protecting the transmission of the monetary policy. What we want to do is we want to make sure that when we tighten by one point, Italy tightens by one point. Of course, in a country which is more insolvent or more, sorry, more indebted, uh, yeah, that was Freudian. <laughs> uh, in a country that is more indebted with 160% debt to GDP right, uh, MP ratio, one point is 1.6 extra deficit. So obviously people are going to start worrying and start kind of pulling, and then they're going to want a bigger interest premium, and then they're going to want to increase rates by instead of one, two, or three, or whatever, and we get into one of those cycles. We don't want that. So we're going to do, so we're going to have two things. First, when we do QT, instead of undoing all the QE at the same time. We're going to undo the stimulus in some countries, but keep it, keep buying debt in others, okay? Um, sorry for using the word stimulus, but. So undo our bond purchases in Germany, and then that, that's when the money we are re recovering from selling that, we're going to buy Italian and Spanish debt. And the second is, we're going to put this TPI, which is something that allows us to buy debt from dividend countries. It's like OMT, right? You're going to say, well, this must be like OMT. Like what Draghi did, if some country's in trouble, we put them in the program and we help them to avoid these liquidity spirals. No. Um, this is the conditionality in this new plan. There's four conditions. The first one is comply with the EU fiscal framework. It's suspended to, to 2023. The second is the absence of severe macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, this is for the EU Commission to decide. They didn't decide it in the 2000s. You can imagine now. Third, let me leave third for one second. Fourth, comply with the EU semester recommendations and recovery plan commitments. I mean, these are really, really soft conditions that the European Commission, as I'll show you in a second, is basically waiving. Uh, you, might, you might disagree, and, and, and we, we can go back to that. So to me, the only real condition is that sustainability. So somebody's going to have to look at it and say, before the European Central Bank enrolls in a program to support one particular country, somebody's going to have to look at it and say, ah, this debt is sustainable, don't worry. And as you all know, it all depends on G. If the assumption on G is good, everything is sustainable. If the assumption on G is bad, nothing is sustainable. And nobody really knows much about G, except that we all know, of course, that demographics in Europe are bad and productivity growth hasn't been fantastic in many countries, to put it mildly. So it is, in my opinion, it's a framework that is departs a lot from Draghi's in that it doesn't really have true conditionality. Um, there's also no fiscal backstop. The member states don't do anything. There is no ASM. The ASM has been basically shot and killed. Okay? They exist. They have a lot of budget and uh, these 500 billion uh, lending abilities there. It's now, they used a bit of it, but okay. They have, they have the lending ability and in the rescues in the past. But now countries know if they can go to the ECB without conditions, why would they go into a program? Okay, so the idea that you're going to have to kind of suffer for this, etc., is is gone, which you might say is good. I mean, the 
if it's, if you just, your view of the world is that it's all liquidity and that you basically need to keep everybody um, liquid, then you're probably happy. The problem is to me, what are the incentives that this gives to the government? So it's hard for the ECB to raise rates without causing, causing fiscal tensions. Let me just remind you, this is the key phrase on which everything hangs, okay? The mechanism can be activated to counter, unwarranted. If there's any economist who understands this word, please say the first word. Unwarranted disorderly market dynamics that pose a serious threat to the transmission of monetary policy across the world. So the whole story falls out unwarranted. If, if Meloni starts doing something crazy and Italy starts in trouble, is that unwarranted or is that because of what she did? If, if the pension reform in Spain fails, which they are trying to do now, and the market gets tense, is that going to be unwarranted or not? To me, it sounds like a political judgment, not an economic judgment. But, I mean, I'm happy to have these opinions among me. So, and they cannot withdraw it. Because if they decide, oh, no, no, what's happening to you, Italy, is really your fault. It's unwarranted. We're pulling. There is no fiscal backstop. backstop. So they literally kill it, OK? The moment the ECB says, sorry, we're not doing anything, you're, you're dead, OK? So I don't know that they can truly credibly threaten a government. We'll see, OK? Maybe I'm, uh, I, I'm not seeing their true firepower is so big, et cetera. Um, so they could really, um, they would need to justify that something's warranted or not, which would sound like a political judgment. And, and my view is that the way this old system leaves with the SGP suspended and clergy and the ECB coming in in this way, is that there are really no incentives for countries' fiscal positions to be brought under control. This is the debt. Um, this is the Maastricht criteria. Debt is not supposed to be over 60%. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the deficit uh, over the whole monetary union uh, period. Uh, the headline deficit is, is there overall in the European Union. Uh, uh, this is the deficit in 2021 and 2020. Okay, you have the, obviously you have the pandemic, so you have big deficits. Which goes together with a big increase in age-related expenditures. This is the aging report. Um, we're talking three, four points in, in, in many countries. And I think that it's going to be very hard to control inflation. And this is totally not in the debate in Europe right now while spending is out of control. I mean, this is, um, we, there's this strong monetary view that, OK, the, if the ECB does what it has to do, then inflation will be controlled. If you get this kind of, 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 of evolution that I show you with the energy crisis for a couple of years or three years, I don't see how that brings inflation under control. And you know what the price dynamics are is, 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 is clear, very related to energy for sure. If these things really did cause some sort of crisis, are we better prepared than in 2012? I don't think so. The doom loop is really is still perfectly possible. First, because you don't have a deposit insurance. The banks are the responsibility of the national government. Second, because the banks are still very exposed to sovereign debt, particularly in Italy and in Spain. Red and green were uh, over 10% of the uh, bank. You can see it here. This is the best place to see it. So let me see if I can get you to see these graphs because they have too much information. So the black is the total debt. So forget about the black. I mean, you know they are very high. The interesting thing is the sum of green and blue. Green is the national central banks. All QE in Europe is not done by the European Central Bank. It's done by the own national central bank. Which kind of, you wonder, like, isn't it the same thing? But it kind of makes you wonder if, if we really believe our own, our own talk, right? It's like, OK, we're going to buy Italian debt, but it will be the Italian national bank who will die. <laughs> I mean, Italians were happy with that originally because, of course, this is more risky debt that yields more, so they're getting money. But now, OK, this is the Italian national bank. These are the Italian banks, OK? so. Um, 50% of holidays, this is Italy, 50% uh, in Italy, okay? So if you look at how it was during the period that uh, some of us were worried about the doom loop, um, it's not that different. It didn't really, we didn't really use these years needed to set up a banking deposit insurance not to force the banks to diversify their sovereign exposures. They just need to hold a, a diversified portfolio of European debt. Why don't they do that? Because the governments love to have a bank at their beck and call that they can say, hey, you have to buy some debt. I'm having trouble with an auction. And because the banks don't see any risk in buying their own government debt, because at the end of the day, if the government is in trouble, the whole 
business model is going to hell anyway. So uh, that branch of the tree, they, that they are not very worried. Um, so the bank's dependence on EC funding, on ECB funding, the interbank market is not lending them as much. It's basically uh, the ECB substituting. And if you look at the recent ESRB, uh, the European Systemic Risk Board, it does start to show some tensions uh, uh, in the uh, kind of at the level of, of the financial crisis. Um, I'm not going to go over the balance sheet of the bank unless people want me to see, but the balance sheet of the European Central Bank has basically, I mean, if you look at a country like Italy, 1.5 trillion, it's in the Italian, it's in the Italian uh, bank. Um, basically, you can see 600 of uh, bonds, of Italian bonds and monetary and financial institutions, Italian banks. And if you look at what happens uh, if, uh, I mean, you, when you start to tighten and you look at that 1.5, you're getting, uh, you're paying 1.5% for the deposits. You, are, you have been lending to the banks and the, and the state at 0%. So basically, that 1.5% or 2% differential is basically going to be taking off these reserves. I mean, you can see how the capital, sorry, where is the capital? You, you can see how the capital, basically, just to give you a sense, the European bank's capital is around 100 billion, let's say, the Spanish, the French, the Italian. Um, if you are losing, let's say, two points, one and a half, two percent on these securities, um, you're losing maybe, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty significant, right? You're maybe losing 10 billion a year. Uh, uh, of course, the capital doesn't matter at some level, but just to get you a sense of of how much this capital, this, this balance sheets grew. Let me just finish with two thoughts. I do want to have some time to have a conversation. Um, so how, we, how can we read, get rid of this very tragic construction? Clutches don't happen just because we are silly. Of course, they happen because of the politics of these things are a nightmare, right? Um, so the, Euro the Europe Commission has tried to put together a proposal to streamline the whole budget and fiscal rules. Um, the issue is maybe two weeks ago. Um, basically, instead of doing like all the other proposals I show you in the third slide, which kind of adds on top of on top or on top, they basically get rid of the entire preventative arm, the entire like one of the two uh, sets of rules that I show you goes away, and instead of all these complicated objectives, they suggest that there's debt sustainability a country, country by country with a methodology which is jointly agreed, that classifies countries in low, medium, and high. For the high countries, it gives them a multi-annual adjustment path based on primary expenditure, which is easy. Up to now, it was the cyclically adjusted deficits. I can tell you this. Again, nobody in economics knows how to calculate the cyclically adjusted deficit. I mean, if you look at those numbers, the revision is like, on average, one and a half, two points during the, I mean, they, they're really like going all over the place because the way they adjust matters so much, right? So instead of that, okay, that sounds reasonable. We're going to look at primary expenditure. And there has to be a path of plausible decline over 10 years um, with a plan adopted by the Council of the Commission. So what are the problems with this? I see several big problems, which are similar to the ones with the new ECB policies. They have to do with the political economy. So the path of plausible decline over 10 years, I mean, only a technocrat could have imagined this could start in four or, in some cases, or for medium exposure, seven years. So I can just go ahead and promise you that in four or maybe seven years, my pension will start dropping, okay? <laughs> I mean, I, there's no government that has a mandate bigger than four to seven years. So, I mean, I can just agree on whatever it is, have a couple of years where this is kind of troublesome, say, I uh, don't you know, and then have my elections. Maybe somebody else will come. Okay. Second, can the commission can be trusted? And I told you, I just hinted at it, that I was a bit, I thought it was a bit problematic. The commission is very, very political. It has become much more political. And third, um, the sanctions are really reputational. They say, look, with these big fines, they are not credible, so we get rid of the fines and we do reputational sanctions. It's like, okay, they weren't credible, but now you get, got rid, and rid of them. So I don't see this as a big Improvement. This is my proof that the Commission is political. These are all the European Union's recovery plans, except uh, Hungary. These were the ones that were approved until the Hungary-Poland plans. 
if you have a professor and he gives these kind of grades, <laughs> you're going to think he has to spend a lot of time grading the exam, OK? There is every single person has an A in question one, an A in question two, a A in question three, an A in question four, a question, and every person has a B in question nine. <laughs> That's like, sounds like politics to me, right? Like, I want to give you a B, but don't worry, these guys also have a B, OK? I mean, I, I don't think the commission is really doing its job here. So what is the alternative path? I, I, I look forward to hearing what this room has to say. But the real fiscal union is, 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 the, is the good path, OK? We have a political union. You have a fiscal union. You do the Hamilton thing. You pass the revenue to the center. The whole thing, that's what, I mean, that's what we need, OK? Now, uh, it could be done with a smaller group, I think. I mean, there are countries that would want that now that the UK is not there. But you will have to have a solution to the Italy problem, to the existing debt. You have 160 debt to GDP. Who's going to assume that? And this is a big country. This is a serious money, OK? Um, so Hamilton compromise, let's say, okay? Where Germany assumes Italy's debt, and uh, I'm sure the German voters will love this, Mark. <laughs> Second possibility, then we have to go back to Maastricht. I mean, then we have to say, look, um, if the state can't fulfill its obligations, it has to default, and the, and the treaty doesn't say anything about default. That's how Illinois is going to deal with its pensions of its teachers and its police people, right? We know they, every year they negotiate these huge pension increases because somebody else will pay for them. That's cheap. We know Illinois cannot pay, but nobody thinks neither Illinois is going to leave the European, the, the United States, nor the dollar, right? It's like, OK, if they eventually cannot pay, they will default. Now, what's the problem? How do you get from here to there? The moment anybody says default's coming, and there is a huge episode I jumped, which is the Deauville walk by Sarkozy and Macron and Merkel, who said in, uh, in, in 2010, default should be an option. The markets go crazy because they want this debt to be free, of course. I mean, everybody wants somebody else to stand between any asset you buy, right? That's, I also like that, but you can't afford it. So, so you need to deal with the new debt issuance. Maybe we can do a partial guarantee of the new debt that is issued and not the pre-existing debt. I don't know. This transition is very tricky, but I think that the system doesn't hold up anymore and we cannot continue with these clutches. So I think it's the, the end of the road for the euro clutches. And I think we have bad incentives from the ECB, bad incentives for the deficit procedure that don't give me any hope that right now uh, the ECB can actually do what it needs to do and, and uh, we need to. Of course, I didn't specifically, although I had it on the, I, I just jumped it because I was looking at the watch, but at the clock. But uh, all of this puts in question the, the single market because if all of this fiscal support, I mean, basically industrial policy, and, and all these energy policy, et cetera, if they're all at the national levels and each country can spend all this money, then the, the single market just depends on who's, which state is actually willing to bet more on your companies. So that's all I wanted to say. Maybe I hope that we can spend a little bit after 15 in order to maybe three or four minutes after at least to hear what people want to say, right? Thank you. Yeah, take them, take them, and then I'll address them together. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Luis. I am Federico Fabrini, you need a pen? Yes, to, if there are going to be several, I don't know how many. Anybody has a pen? Yeah. We've got for me a pen. Thank you. Yep, yeah, start, Federico, thank you. Yes, I, I am a professor of EU law in, in Dublin and, and a fellow here at Princeton on, on sabbatical. Um, I feel your pain for Spain, but Italy didn't even qualify, so try to feel my pain, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> Uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested on the issues about fiscal capacity and, and sort of your last slide about thinking about the future. And uh, maybe a note, you might know this morning, the German Constitutional Court delivered a very important ruling where it rejected the challenge against the EU on resource decision and, and basically ruled that it was totally legal to create a generation of EU. Now, the ruling is full of perpassive identity crap, uh, which I don't uh, very much interesting because the coach says, yes, you can do common debt with limitation here and that, and it, I think it opens up the way. So my question to you is, don't you think you were a bit skeptical about Hamilton, but don't you see like a momentum in that direction? Even the uh, financing facility for Ukraine, 18 billion euro for 2023, that's again, uh, common debt uh, raised by the EU, backed up by the budget, 
So the new type of fiscal federalist type of thing. And you know, a year ago, people were saying, oh, that's one off. It's only for the pandemic. And then you have immediately the war, and you need to be the same so legal structure to achieve the same purpose. So don't you see some positive potentials uh, out there? And of course, when we talk about Hamilton, let's not forget that they had to wait 120 years before they changed their constitution here to allow for direct taxes. So, it, you know, long-term projects, right? I agree. <coughs> Thank you very much for a super interesting talk. My name is Stefan Kolev. I'm from Bulgaria originally. I'm a professor of economics in Germany, and currently I'm at the James Madison program here, so we talk about medicine and Hamilton every week, mm -hmm. uh, historically. Um, so I learned from you, first of all, that Bulgaria should wait joining the Eurozone. It might not be perfect timing to do that. I don't know what the alternative is, huh? We have mm -hmm. a very heated discussion about it right now. We'd rather stay away for the moment, I guess. I have two questions for you. The one is, I've done some work on the early face of European integration, and specifically on Jürgen Röpke, who was an important advisor to Erhard Ben Hadnauer, uh, and one of the first European public intellectuals when it comes to political economy. And so he has these two visions of Europe. He says it can become a large Switzerland or a large France, basically being decentralized or, or centralized politically. And I think that the way you describe the European Union, and specifically the European Monetary Union, is that we've been moving since Jean Monnet towards a large France. So my question is, could it be that we keep moving, and if we go for the fiscal union, and we really go for fiscal transfers, like systematic fiscal transfers from the north to the south, something which Hotke said in the 50s would happen, which means that something that is meant to be cement, the euro, turns out to be dynamite and blows up the whole project. And my second question is brief. In June, I was flying with the German Minister of Finance to Athens in Sofia, and um, my charge was to brief him on Bulgaria, but I really found the Greek story interesting. So they've paid back the debt ahead of time, and they've been doing quite well. And on one of the slides, on the last slides, you had Greece yeah. as one of the exceptions. The three countries that were in the programs, uh, Ireland, Greece, and Portugal, have actually benefited from the programs very much. You, this, this is exactly my question. So would you say that Italy had come into the same program, that Italy would be in better shape today than it is? learning from, as you said, Ireland or Greece or Portugal. Thank you. No, I, I, just a just terrific presentation. Um, I, I, I wondered when you think the people are going to have to bite this bullet that you present. Because it seems to me that as long as the war goes on, and as long as the transatlantic trade war goes on, as long as you can say you need state aid because the United States is doing that, you're going to continue with the present momentum. And the, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's like a, a world war situation, um, that you just suspend all the rules while the war goes on. And it's only when, when the war ends. That, um, so I, I had a question about the end of the point. Yeah, very happy to. So, so to Federico's on, on the fiscal um, capacity, Yes, we are issuing more debt, but my main concern was about the revenue. And it's the fiscal capacity has, has uh, issuing debt, but also, I think, has a plan to, to, uh, to deal with that. Um, I think I would be much more sanguine or much more optimistic if there was already some revenue that was signed and that was clearly going to fund this. I think um, just, just adding the 18 billion is, 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 is not is not uh, to Ukraine. It's not enough to reassure me. I'm glad that the European Constitutional Court, uh, the German Constitutional the Casual Court, agreed. I didn't know because I was I was kind of not even looking at the internet uh, today. Uh, I didn't even know the Spanish game. <laughs> so um, on on Bulgaria and and Mason, I don't know what I don't know what Bulgaria should do because I don't know what the alternative is. But but I do agree that it, this this problem, if if increased, could blow up. The, the union. I think that um, if we have given, if, if, if this clutch reconstruction that has all these kind of complementarities in each part is kind of difficult to move because there's a constituency that doesn't want to go and, and the whole thing kind of is unstable uh, and we don't know how to actually bite the bullet that I want to talk about in a sec, um, then this could bring the whole thing down. I, 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 would, I would be worried about that. I am actually very worried about it. And I think that will happen in England 
in, uh, in September should make us all aware that these things turn on a dime, right? I mean, there's just one bad news about the pensions, one bad news about something, and then people start to worry. And then you have the ECB has to intervene very aggressively, and then people start to be concerned. Um, so, yes, I am actually, I mean, Ashoka is here, and he, he will have his expertise to draw on, but I'm actually a big fan of the programs. I know there's, nobody has been writing about this, and I think they have to be written. The structural reforms that the European Union, the IMF, uh, imposed worked. Portugal had 221 things to do, and it did 221. I mean, it is actually um, amazing how much these countries complied. They didn't have a choice. Uh, Spain only had a program with respect to the financial sector. And actually, the financial sector in Spain was reformed. All these saving banks, which were politicized, controlled by politicians, etc., disappeared. I mean, so, and that's a big, big improvement in the Spanish financial in economic structure. So, so yes, it was, it was actually, I think somebody has to write in defense of those programs. I mean, maybe I should do it at some point. And three, to Harold's uh, questions on... Uh, Yes, I agree. As long as the war is over, we shouldn't actually make this more difficult than it is. Um, I would like Europe to be able to react together um, and Europe to react together in a way that um, is also fiscally responsible in the medium term. Uh, so it could be borrowing, but in a way that is, that is, that is a bit less uh, free for all. Um, the question is, is the political economy such that this system can be put in place and the bullet can be beaten after the war? And, and I think that it's very tricky. I mean, uh, Italy hasn't grown uh, in... I mean, Italy's productivity growth has disappeared since 95. It hasn't grown in a couple of decades. Spain hasn't grown since 2007. I mean, without growth, it's going to be very hard to get this... Uh, fiscal house in order, and, and without reforms and some requirements from Europe's and conditions, I don't think that's going to be reforms. That's basically my personal position, right? You need those reforms that we had with the programs in many of these countries to change the productivity growth trajectory, and you cannot have them without some conditionality. So to me, that's the key missing element. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, Great, great talk, and you, you, you kind of uh, tempted me with this, what this one warranted me, because I'm on the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, and we tried to stop using that word when it comes to setting the uh, CCYB, because effectively, we don't know what it means and we can't measure it. Um, but somehow there's this notion of, well, counterproductive tightening of credit conditions where it's individually sensible, but in the collective, it turns out to be collectively not the right thing for the So that's the long sentence that no one understands. So, um, but it does raise the issue, though, that whenever a central bank goes in and does something, they're blurring market signals. Very uh, useful, as we saw in the UK, as a disciplinary measure uh, to governments and others, I guess, for taking bad decisions, or decisions that the markets think are bad. So I'm wondering. It all made sense to me. What seemed to be missing, but I'd love to know what you think, is how do you um, create a system where the central bank can help with financial stability, but still sort of make sure that individual countries or institutions that decisions are disciplined and, and kind of suffer a bit, so that politically it becomes unpalatable to take those decisions more forward-looking. Uh, I don't know what the design feature would be. I think I think I think Draghi got it more or less right. If there is a liquidity issue, like a developing country-like crisis, like uh, Greece, um, etc., suffered. Although that was also a solvency crisis, not a liquidity crisis in, in a strict sense. But anyway, if this happens, then I can see the ECB having to intervene. What I cannot see is having to intervene without conditions. That to me is the part that. Either you have the market discipline and you're saying, look, I mean, don't get close to the edge because you're going to be in trouble and nobody will help you. Or you have some both political discipline where you say, well, I'll help you, but then these are the conditions. Absent market and political discipline, I think there is no incentives for action. I'm so sorry. 